All right, so get this. You want the entire history of life on Earth, mm -hmm. all the way from those single-celled pioneers to us, right? Yeah. And you want it distilled from a biology textbook chapter right. diagrams and all, plus some research on snails. Uh-huh. Fascinating stuff, by the way. Yeah, definitely. Buckle up, because we're about to go on a journey. Okay. Billions of years in the making. What's fascinating about this deep dive is that we're not just talking about memorizing names and dates. Right. We're going to uncover the driving forces behind this epic evolution. Yeah. The hows and whys that shapes the incredible biodiversity we see today. Exactly. It's about understanding the big picture, mm -hmm. those key turning points that led to the world as we know it. Right. So let's start at the very beginning. Okay. Picture Earth. 4.6 billion years ago. Okay. A fiery, chaotic world bombarded by asteroids. Wow. Not exactly a welcoming environment. No, not at all. Right. Definitely not a place you'd want to take a stroll. Yeah. It was a world of intense volcanic activity. Yeah. With an atmosphere thick with gases like methane, ammonia, and carbon dioxide. Right. Oxygen, which is essential for us, was virtually non-existent. It's mind-blowing to think that life arose from such an alien environment. Yeah. For a long time, the famous Miller-Urey experiment right. was the go-to explanation for how those first organic molecules, huh. the building blocks of life, yeah. came about. They simulated those early Earth conditions in the lab okay. and showed how simple molecules could react to form amino acids. Oh, wow. The components of proteins. Oh, cool. But the story doesn't end there. Okay. More recent research suggests that those volcanic eruptions, mm -hmm. as dramatic as they were, right. might have been crucial in providing the energy and the chemical ingredients needed to kickstart life. So those volcanoes weren't just destructive forces. Mm -hmm. They were like giant crucibles brewing up the primordial soup from which life emerged. Exactly. And then there's the deep sea vent hypothesis. Yes. Another compelling idea is that life might have originated in these hydrothermal vents. Okay. Especially the alkaline ones. Interesting. Deep in the ocean. Oh, wow. These vents spew out warm, mineral-rich water, yep. creating chemical gradients that could have powered those early life processes. It's amazing to think that life might have originated in these extreme environments. Right. It makes you wonder what else might be lurking out there in the universe. Uh-huh. But okay, we have the building blocks, the molecules. All right. How do we go from there to something that actually resembles a cell? Yeah. We need some kind of container. Right. That's where things get really interesting. Okay. Scientists believe that those simple molecules started assembling into more complex structures like proteins and nucleic acids. Mm. And here's the twist. RNA, not DNA, might have been the first genetic material. RNA. Yeah. But isn't DNA the blueprint of life? It is now, but RNA is like its versatile older cousin. Okay. It can store genetic information like DNA. Right. But it can also act as a catalyst, speeding up chemical reactions like an enzyme. Oh, wow. It's like the ultimate multitasker of the early cellular world. So RNA was pulling double duty. Yeah. But how did these molecules get packaged into something resembling a cell? Exactly. Imagine these tiny membrane-bound droplets called protocells. Protocells. They're not true cells yet. Okay. But they exhibit some lifelike properties. Got it. Recent research has shown how these protocells can form spontaneously, wow. grow, divide, and even absorb RNA. It's like they're these tiny self assembling factories paving the way for the first true cells. Yeah. It's mind blowing to think that those early steps towards life might have been happening all over the planet. Right. In these volcanic hot springs or deep sea vents. It really is a fascinating picture. Totally. And it challenges our assumptions about what life needs to survive. Yeah. If life could thrive in those extreme conditions, it opens up all sorts of possibilities for life beyond Earth. Okay, so we have these protocells, but how do we know any of this actually happened billions of years ago? Right. I mean, we weren't there to take pictures. That's where fossils come in. Oh. They are our window into deep time. Yeah. Those snapshots of ancient life preserved in rocks. Right. The fossil record is like a giant puzzle mm -hmm. with each piece telling us a bit more about the history of life. It's like being a detective. Yeah. Piecing together clues from the past. Exactly. And these clues are found in layers of rock, right? Right. Each stratum telling a different part of the story. The deeper you go, the older the rocks and the fossils they contain. Right. And it's not just guesswork. Oh. We can use techniques like radiometric dating to figure out the actual age of those fossils. Wow. Giving us a timeline of life on Earth. So we're not just speculating. Right. We're talking about hard evidence backed by scientific methods. Exactly. And what does that evidence tell us? When do we first see 
those single-celled pioneers in the fossil record? The earliest fossils of single-celled organisms, those prokaryotes, date back to around 3.5 billion years ago. 3.5 billion years ago. They were simple. Right. But they were incredibly successful dominating the planet for over a billion years. Over a billion years? Yeah. That's an incredibly long reign. It is. But then something dramatic happened that changed everything. The oxygen revolution. Ooh, the oxygen revolution. Those early prokaryotes, some of them were photosynthetic, mm -hmm. meaning they used sunlight to produce energy. Okay. And guess what their waste product was? Oxygen. You got it. Wow. And at first, this oxygen reacted with iron in the oceans, Interesting. creating those banded iron formations we see in rocks today. Oh. It's like a chemical fingerprint of this ancient biological process. So those red stripes in the rocks are a testament to the rise of oxygen. Exactly. And it must have had a huge impact on life at the time. Absolutely. For those organisms that couldn't tolerate oxygen, it was a disaster. Oh, no. But for others, it opened up a whole new way of life. Okay. Cellular respiration, which uses oxygen to generate energy, uh -huh. is far more efficient than anaerobic respiration. So it's like the planet got a major upgrade. Yeah. But not everyone was ready for it. Right. It was a time of both destruction and opportunity. Exactly. And this shift to an oxygen-rich environment paved the way for the evolution of more complex life forms. Which brings us to another major turning point. Okay. The emergence of eukaryotic cells. Right. These cells, with their nucleus and organelles, mm -hmm. are the building blocks of all multicellular life. Right. From plants and fungi to animals, including us. And the prevailing theory for how these eukaryotic cells came about is endosymbiosis. Endosymbiosis. A story of cells within cells. Okay. It's a beautiful example of how cooperation can lead to incredible leaps in complexity. Wait, so you're saying that one cell engulfed another, mm -hmm. and instead of digesting it, they struck up a partnership? Precisely imagine an ancestral prokaryotic cell engulfing another cell, maybe a bacterium. Okay. But instead of destroying it, they develop this mutually beneficial relationship. Oh, why? The engulfed cell over time becomes an organelle, like a mitochondrion. Okay. Which is the powerhouse of the eukaryotic cell. That is so wild. It is. Cells eating cells, then working together. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. And what's the evidence for this seemingly far-fetched idea? There's a lot of evidence. Okay. For example, mitochondria and chloroplasts. Right. The organelles responsible for photosynthesis in plants uh -huh. have their own DNA. Oh, really? Which is remarkably similar to bacterial DNA. Uh. They also replicate independently of the cell, just like bacteria. So it's like these ancient bacteria are still living inside our cells, powering our very existence. It is a pretty amazing thought. It's a reminder that life is full of surprises. It is. And sometimes the most incredible leaps forward come from unexpected partnerships. Absolutely. And this partnership, this endosymbiotic event, was a game changer. It was, huh? It led to the evolution of all eukaryotic organisms. Wow. Setting the stage for the incredible diversity of life we see today. Okay, so we've got these eukaryotic cells more complex and capable than their prokaryotic ancestors. But we're still talking about single-celled organisms, right? When do we start seeing the first multicellular life? The leap to multicellularity is another one of those milestones that makes you step back and say, wow, how did that happen? We start seeing the first multicellular eukaryotes in the fossil record around 1.2 billion years ago. They were pretty simple at first, just clumps of cells working together. I can imagine. It's like those early single-celled organisms decided, hey, let's team up and see what we can accomplish together. But how do you go from a loose association of cells to a truly integrated multicellular organism? That's a question that keeps scientists busy. It probably involved a series of steps with cells becoming increasingly specialized and dependent on each other. We also see the evolution of new ways for cells to communicate and coordinate their activities. It's like those early multicellular organisms were figuring out the rules of teamwork, and those rules were being written into their genes. Fascinating. It makes you wonder if those early experiments in multicellularity were happening all over the place, with some lineages succeeding and others hitting a dead end. It's like evolution was trying out different possibilities, seeing what worked. Exactly. And... The fossil record gives us glimpses of those early multicellular pioneers. You mentioned the Adeacaran period earlier, those strange, soft-bodied creatures that lived before the Cambrian explosion, some of them over a meter long. Right. They were like something out of a science fiction movie. They weren't predators, but grazers and filter feeders, peacefully munching on microbial mats or sifting through the water for food. 
it makes you wonder what would have happened if they had continued to thrive. It's fascinating to think about those alternative evolutionary paths, isn't it? But the Ediacaran world was about to change dramatically enter the Cambrian explosion. This period, about 535 to 525 million years ago, marks a dramatic increase in the diversity and complexity of animal life. The Cambrian explore it's like evolution went into overdrive, right? Suddenly we have all these new body plans, predators with yeah. claws and armor-plated cray. It's like the arms race of evolution had officially begun. It was an incredible burst of diversification. We see the appearance of most of the animal phyla we know today, those major groups like arthropods, mollusks, and chordates. But it wasn't quite as sudden as we used to think. Oh, so it's not like these animals just popped into existence overnight. No, not exactly. DNA evidence suggests that these lineages actually originated much earlier, maybe as far back as 700 million years ago. They were just small and less diverse for, for a long time, perhaps because of environmental constraints. But then something changed, the environment shifted, and boom, those lineages were poised to take advantage of the new opportunities leading to that rapid diversification we see in the Cambrian. So it's like those lineages were waiting in the wings, ready for their moment in the spotlight. And when that moment came, they exploded onto the scene, filling all those ecological niches. It's a reminder that evolution is often a combination of chance and opportunity. Exactly. And this explosion of life wasn't just happening in the oceans. Life was also making its way onto land around this time. Right. It's like a whole new frontier opened up full of challenges and opportunities. But imagine the challenges dealing with gravity, preventing water loss, finding new ways to reproduce it must have been a huge leap for those early land pioneers. It was, and those challenges led to some remarkable adaptations. Plants evolved vascular systems for transporting water and nutrients, waxy coatings to prevent desiccation, and eventually seeds for more efficient reproduction. And they didn't make this transition alone right. There's that fascinating partnership between plants and fungi that's thought to date back to this early colonization of land. You're right. The symbiotic relationship between plants and fungi, specifically the mycorrhiza that help plants absorb water and nutrients, is thought to be a key innovation that allowed plants to thrive on land. It's another example of how collaboration can be a driving force in evolution. But what about the animals? Mm -hmm. Which brave pioneers first ventured onto land? Arthropods, particularly insects and spiders, were among the first appearing on land around 450 million years ago. They already had exoskeletons, which provided support and protection from desiccation, a huge advantage in those harsh, dry environments. That makes sense. It's like they were pre-adapted for life on land, and then a little later we see the first tetrapods, those four-limbed vertebrates, mm. that eventually gave rise to amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, including us. Right. Those early tetrapods evolved from lobe-finned fishes with their sturdy fins that could support their weight on land. It's a beautiful example of how evolution can repurpose existing structures for new functions. So those fins, which were originally used for swimming, gradually evolved into limbs for walking. That's incredible. But this transition to land wasn't a one-time event, right? Okay. Amphibians still need to return to water to reproduce, and then reptiles evolved those amniotic eggs that allowed them to break free from the water completely. Exactly. The evolution of the amniotic egg was a major breakthrough, allowing reptiles to conquer drier environments and diversify into an incredible array of forms, from dinosaurs to snakes to lizards. And speaking of dinosaurs, they were the dominant land animals for over 150 million years. It's mind-boggling to think about the vastness of geologic time and the rise and fall of these incredible creatures. It really is. The history of life on Earth is full of these epic sagas, these stories of triumph and extinction, adaptation and innovation. And these stories are written in the rocks and the fossils and the DNA of every living thing. It's a reminder that we are part of this grand narrative, this ongoing story of life that stretches back billions of years. But this story isn't just about the past, is it? It's also about the present and the future. You're right. The forces that have shaped life over billions of years are still at work today. And one of the most pressing questions facing us now is whether we are witnessing a sixth mass extinction driven by human activities. It's a sobering thought and one we can't ignore. We'll delve into that question when we return for the final part of our deep dive into the history of life. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. We've been on quite a ride through the history of life, haven't we? From those single cell pioneers to the dinosaurs to the incredible diversity we see today. But as we wrap up this deep dive, it feels almost impossible to ignore the elephant in the room, the potential for a sixth mass extinction and our role in it. It's definitely a shadow that hangs over our understanding of the natural world. Yeah. You know, we know that extinction is a natural process, a Let's constant see. background hum in the symphony of life, but the current rate of extinction is estimated to be 
100 to 1,000 times higher than the background rate. That's not just a hum. It's a siren. It really puts things into perspective. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the big five mass extinctions, catastrophic events that reshape the planet. But this time, it's not a volcano or an asteroid driving the change. It's us. That's right. The evidence is pretty clear. Human activities from habitat destruction to climate change to pollution are putting immense pressure on ecosystems worldwide. And we're seeing the consequences in the decline of countless species across the globe. It's easy to get caught up in the big numbers, the statistics of extinction rates. But I think it's important to remember that each number represents a living creature, a species with its own unique evolutionary history and role in the ecosystem. Absolutely. We're not just talking about losing those charismatic megafauna, the elephants, the tigers, the polar bears. It's about the loss of biodiversity as a whole, the intricate web of life that sustains us all. Right. It's like pulling threads out of a tapestry. Yeah. You might not notice the impact at first, but eventually the whole thing starts to unravel and we depend on that tapestry on those ecosystems for our own survival. Exactly. It's not just about saving nature for nature's sake, although that's an important ethical consideration. It's about recognizing that we are part of this interconnected web of life. We need healthy ecosystems for clean air and water, for food and medicine, for climate regulation. Our fate is intertwined with the fate of all living things. So what can we do? Is it all doom and gloom? Or is there hope for averting this potential sixth mass extinction? I believe there's always hope we have the knowledge, the tools, and the capacity to make a difference. It starts with acknowledging the problem, understanding the scale of the challenge, and taking responsibility for our actions. Right. It's about recognizing that we're not just passive observers of the natural world, but active participants. And our choices, both individual and collective, have consequences. Exactly. It's about making more informed choices about how we consume, how we travel, how we use energy. It's about supporting sustainable practices, reducing our ecological footprint, and advocating for policies that protect biodiversity. And it's about education, right? Sharing this knowledge, inspiring others to care about the natural world, and fostering a sense of connection to all life on Earth. Absolutely. We need to reconnect with nature to understand its beauty and its fragility. We need to remember that we are part of this grand evolutionary story, and we have a responsibility to ensure that this story continues for generations to come. Well said. This deep dive has been a real eye-opener for me. We've gone from the fiery birth of Earth to the potential for a sixth mass extinction. We've explored those key evolutionary transitions, the forces that have shaped life, and the interconnectedness of all living things. And that brings us to the end of our exploration of the history of life on Earth, from its humble beginnings to the complex web of life that we see today. It's a story of resilience, adaptation, and the constant interplay between organisms and their environment. And as we've seen, this story is still being written. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey. And until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep marveling at the wonders of the natural world.